Welcome to Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius, your source for horror, sci-fi, suspense, and all things violent. Thank you so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius. Today at the end of the episode, I will be playing the first chapter of Ain't No Messiah because the audiobook is still on sale and the Kindle version is free. So for the next couple of days, uh, yeah, get it. If you haven't read it, check it out. Unless you're easily offended, you should probably have a pretty good idea if you're listening to me talk, if you're listening to the podcast, if you read my other books, what this might be about. This guy is trying to decide whether or not he is the second coming of Christ. His father has preached to the world that he is, but Joshua is not very bright and kind of into porn, listens to metal. A lot of crazy shit happens in the book. Kind of sad stuff too. And it's all about him trying to figure out whether or not he is the Messiah because he can't seem to die. So who knows if he's the Messiah, if he is not the Messiah. That is book one of five in the series. I just need to write the other four. They're all plotted out. Book two, the bridge, or I don't know what it'll actually be called, has been done, halfway done forever. So I need to work on, well, eventually one day I'll do it. So don't get your hopes up on this one. I, like I've been talking about, all my focus is on trying not to die. Except for today. Today is Ain't No Messiah Day. Woo! All right, Ain't No Messiah. But before we get into that, what else happened this week? Oh, the contest winners were all notified. I am sending off books. Well, I sent off a bunch of books all together. It was, I probably, it wasn't over a hundred. I don't think I said it was, I lied on social media. I think it's about 80 books. So that's because some of them haven't been sent out. As soon as those ones, I had to make a, another trip to the post office. Last time I went, I saw how long the line was. I was like, those people could wait a couple more days because holy shit. I, it's not because I was just being lazy. I actually had to go and pick up my kids. So there was that. I just contacted the latest bunch of winners on the last giveaway, which was Try Not To Die Worldwide. I haven't heard back from everyone, but hopefully I will hear back from them soon so I can mail off that those books. I'm anxious to see how people respond to the Try Not To Dies. But yeah, so many copies. I pretty much got rid of all the copies I had here that I would be selling at conventions and stuff like that. Good part of that is I have not wanted to go to any conventions. And the really awesome part is I think these people are going to like the book. They are already interested in a choose your own adventure type book. That's what the Trend to Die series is. It is not tied to choose your own adventure, but people that like choose your own adventure books tend to like these books, right? It's just, they're a little more violent. There's a lot more death. That's the part I like to do. Telling the main story is cool, but sometimes I don't like this Try Not to Die in Ghostland. That should be out. I think we're shooting for July, first week of July. Duncan Ralston, that's his world. He already had the trilogy on the Ghostland and all these other little pieces to it. So he wrote the entire story. That's his story. The Trying to Die at Ghostland survivor version is his story. I just gave some editing and a little input like that. Fortunately, he let me work on and help him design the death scenes. So that's my contribution to that book. Other ones, you know, I might write the entire main story and then just go having input back and forth. So I might do a complete rewrite. It just depends on who I'm working with and how they want to work. We just figure out what is best for us. How are we going to do this? Had a, I totally forgot about that. Had a very cool call with Steve Montgomery. Awesome friend. I first met Steve, well, probably back in South Carolina. I think we trained together when he was like 14, something crazy one time at the fight farm in Florence, South Carolina. Eric Lee runs that place. So that was a very cool experience. One of the best things that happened to me when I was down there in South Carolina. But I really connected with Steve when I interviewed him for Unlocking the Cage. I went down to Florida, got to hang out with him, train with him at American Top Team. That's awesome. Now he's at American Top Team Asheville. Super busy creating this incredible gym. I can't wait to go down there, hang out with him, experience life out there. So definitely looking forward to that. The other exciting thing was we have had trying to die super high, nearly finished for a very, very long time. We were starting to go back over it and editing it and it was good, but just like it's in the way so many projects, I'm not available. I barely have time to get all my stuff done. So we just had it connected and I asked him, I was like, Hey, what do you, I just have a break. Cause Ghostland's just about done. I'm going to give Evan notes back on dark fairy tale. So we move forward with that. And then I can, I was like, I could easily just jump on super high and just knock it out. And then I'll give it to you for approval. You tell me what you like or don't like. 
but I'll take more control, just get it done. And he felt bad with me doing that, saying that he was didn't feel like he was doing his share. I was like, dude, what are you talking about? You created this whole story. Like he came up with this entire story. He wrote the whole thing. I've been helping rewrite it along the way, but and with most of the death scenes too. I maybe I gave some ideas. I'm not sure. I can't even remember that far back. I have to look to see how many death scenes we have done. But it's going to be a lot of fun. I said, hey, that lets me contribute more. I want to do that. I'm excited to do that. And so he said, oh, cool. And we'll still have talks along the way to make sure we're both on the same page. But exciting news is that book will be coming out this year, too. I was like, yeah, why not? If it, Unless I take a look at it and I'm like, oh, dude, I need to put way more work than I thought, then it won't happen. But I don't think that's the case. Not at all. I can move very fast, especially when I'm focused. And I am very focused. I am planning on making October a success when I go to the book fair in Frankfurt this morning. So I wake up now at four, today was 4.10. And it's cool. I'm happy. I'm in a good mood. I go out, I stretch a tiny bit, get to work, five o'clock phone call, well, Zoom with a PR firm in Germany. And that went really well. going to hire them to do a little campaign to get exposure in Germany. I'm telling them what I want done. I want to get Try Not To Die, very popular, especially in Germany. So I wanna start building that up. That's why I'm hiring them, taking that kind of step. That's probably one of the biggest steps I've taken in my career, but nothing too crazy, right? But that combined with the cost of the fare plus everything else. So that was at five o'clock in the morning because of the time difference. Then I went into the sauna, did some good stretching in there, got some writing, was working on a dark, uh, trying to die in a dark fairy tale, got the kids ready for school or with my wife's help, took my son to school, came home, played five minutes of guitar, took my daughter to school, came home, got on a call with a guy from Berlin about Amazon ads and Facebook ads only targeted at Germany, only focusing on the Try Not To Die series. So that went really well. We're going to put that into play. Because what I want to do is by the time I get to Germany, I want a following there. I want the series to be doing very well there. And I want international publishers to see, okay, this is something that we want. Here's this series. It's already going to, at the very least, we'll have the seven books out in it. Plus a couple little pieces like trying to die back at grandma's house, trying to die in a hell hole. Hope I'll have that covered this week. Sorry, John's taking so long, but that's a short story. Um, we're going to have some other small things from different authors that are writing for like trying to die death fest confessions. Those should be fun. Just doing as much as I can for trying not to die because I think that is a very marketable product. Also finally getting merchandise done. Brian Ochoa, who did this death fest tattoo. Well, he didn't do it on me. That was Elvis amazing job, but Brian is the one who did the initial design for me. That's going to be in the book. He's also making a Try Not To Die at Death Best shirt. That thing is going to be awesome. Haven't seen it yet, but I know I'm going to love it. He did the back cover. Oh, almost forgot. The cover for Death Best is now up. You know what? I'll try to put it in here if I remember. Depends on how tired I am tomorrow morning and if I have enough time before I go to 6 a.m. jiu-jitsu class. It looks really cool. My buddy Jay did an amazing job. So he put it all together. He did the, the front cover, the spine, and then he blended Brian's design for the back cover and threw it right on there. Looks awesome. So very excited about that. Pre-orders will be out soon. That book is going to be coming out. I think I said June 4th. I still need to figure out the printing situation, how quickly it's going to be, but I believe they should be done around June 4th. So that's what we're shooting for right now. That should happen. That's pretty exciting that that's coming out. Translate at Ghostland is going to be awesome. You know, that's pretty much wrapped up. Just the final edit, figure out the cover artist, all that little stuff and and fun stuff so that's really cool to have that done you know and again still got to go back over it after we get back from the editor and final runs like that but i'm saying done for now so meanwhile i'll build up trying to die a dark fairy tale i'm going to take a look at super high and got some other ones coming in and every week or every other week i'm meeting with my buddy nico from germany he's in dusseldorf so we talk about his series, his massive series that we're going to talk to publishers about, and then his individual Try Not to Die that is based off of that series. And so that was going to be really cool if you guys are into Harry Potter, stuff like that. This is going to be a much smarter version. Not because of me, because of Nico, because that's like, he's he's got it down. I think that's going to be a really cool series. So there's that. That's where my focus is. That's why... 
the second book to Tales of the Blessed and Broken, and third book, and fourth book, and fifth book. I'm not sure when they're going to ever be done. But I'm also planning on hustling with this thing. Hopefully, the, the so the goal the goal is 20 books, 20 books in the series. I already have more contracts than that. I think I have 25 to 30, but some of them just aren't going to happen. Um, and that's due to me, that's due to co-authors, that's due to life. But that's also cool because whatever 20 make it, and I'm not saying that for sure I'm going to cut off at 20, but the 20 that do make it are all going to be awesome. Oh, and in addition to the Try Not to Die at Death Best shirt, Brian is also designing a Try Not to Die concert type shirt. I had wanted to do that a long time ago, just didn't, never got around to it. It's going to have all the titles on the back along with the cities that the books take place in. I think that's going to be really cool. So it will be cool to finally have merch. I never did it before. I always, I don't know, not want to be too salesy. And at the time, like, well, who wants to try not to die shirt? But I think it is building. I think it's going to snowball. I appreciate it. It's because of all you guys telling your friends, leaving reviews. That is so helpful. So thank you to everyone that's done that. I'm not forgetting about trying not to die in the wild west. because That's still, that's still our baby. John was repping it at the LA Times Festival of Books. I did not make it because... I'm a broken old man with a bad knee, but the knee's doing better. I even had the opportunity to help teach a class today at 10 Planet Jiu-Jitsu Whittier. Felt really unqualified to do it, but it felt good. All right, guys, I'm exhausted. It's almost my bedtime. Tomorrow morning, I have to get up early for another phone call before I go train and take the kids and do all that. And then I'll hurry home and I'll do the newsletter. So the newsletter is now going to be a little bit later than usual. And that's due to jiu-jitsu, but that's cool because I'm enjoying jiu-jitsu. Even if I'm not able to do everything, I'm still getting out there. I'm still interacting. I'm still having fun. I'm still, yeah, I'm in a better mood afterwards and I'm going to be up anyways, right? So why not do something that's good for me? I could just as easily stay home and do yoga and that would be great too. Remember, Ain't No Messiah is free on Kindle. Pick it up and you don't need to have a Kindle in order to get the book. Just pick it up on Amazon and get the free app and use that on any device, your computer to read the books or pick up the audiobook. This is Rick Cheddar reading, I don't know how much I'm going to put on here, maybe one, maybe two chapters. I hope you guys enjoy it. Again, not trying to offend anyone. I'm not saying there's no Messiah. I'm saying this is a piece of fiction where this character's father has told him since birth that he's the second coming of Christ and it's him trying to figure out whether or not he is. But you have been warned. Hopefully you'll enjoy it. Hopefully you'll dig it. If you don't, just please hit stop. I don't want you to listen to it if you wouldn't like it. I'm not going to force my mom to listen to this one. She would not like it. So I tell her, mom, don't read this. Don't tell your friends about it. It's cool. I get it. It's not for you. Maybe it is for you. So check it out. If you like it, awesome. Tell your friends. If you don't, tell them don't pick it up. All right, guys. Later. Chapter 1 Most of my life I've been saying I ain't no messiah. All my life people have been swearing to God I am. And now I'm here on this throne of flames, not knowing what to think, figuring it probably don't matter either way. This cathedral spread out before me is unbelievable. It takes up the entire 47th floor, shiny oak pews and plush red carpet stretching to every corner. A massive glass pyramid above us, the adjustable tent letting in just the right light. 50,000 square feet, the largest in the world, high above Las Vegas Boulevard, the epicenter of sin. And even crazier still is that this is just one floor. The Church of His Son owns the entire complex. So not just this building, but also the six connected ones. The giant lake that spans the front and the massive water park behind us. There's not a soul present here, besides a few friends and me, but it's already sold out for the next three years. I haven't seen my massive suite on the 46th floor, and I never will. This emptiness, this loneliness, 
this time to myself was my final request, the price Father paid for me to play along. As much as I was against this place, I can't deny they did a tremendous job. The glass cross elevators adorning the front of each building are my favorite part, especially when they're set to red, a hint of flame flickering up. My sanctuary sits atop the highest cross, directly above where the triple-wide elevator deposits visitors. Tonight's Mass, my very first live speech, won't be full capacity. The whole world will be watching, but in here, there'll only be people in the three pews before me. Only those whose dedication has proven they deserve to bear witness. The glass that makes up the box surrounding the sanctuary is the same two-inch thick bulletproof material used in the walls. With so many people wanting me dead, it made little sense to make things easy for them. That's why we've got a lock on the glass door and the Gone with the Wind style staircase to separate the masses from their Messiah. This sanctuary is 20 by 20, just big enough to hold the throne, the altar, and the pulpit, all carved by Father. On the top of the pulpit, hidden beneath the lost gospels, he installed a small monitor I can use as a teleprompter so there's less of a chance I'll mess up my words. And if I ever need help with my lines when I'm looking up, Father stuck a bigger one on the back of the massive mega screen hanging above the first pew. TV's been nothing but death and pain, sex and lies, all of which I've had my fill. I leave it all off and enjoy the silence. That's not really silence, thanks to the faint shouts from down below. Jeremy said he couldn't hear them on my mic, but I, I know I'm not just imagining them. Father didn't want the throne to swivel, said it cheapened his work of art, but I put my foot down listed it as another demand. Sitting four feet from the edge would have paralyzed me with fear five months ago, but that's when things were different. Now I feel nothing looking at the empty skies. Not a single helicopter in sight. Everyone from news crews to tourists are grounded until after my speech. There's no one around to film me popping this Percocet, downing it with the rest of this whiskey. If I sit too long, the blood in my legs start to clot and ache something fierce. Plus, I've spent too much of my life staying still, eyes locked on the uncertainty and absurdity of it all. It's time to show myself and see what's out there. The black suit father had custom tailored four months ago is it's baggy. My appetite all but gone since the explosion I shouldn't have survived. But when this thing happens, I'll stand up tall, shoulders back, chest out. I'll look every bit as powerful as he wants you to believe. If I've learned anything, image is everything. It's all that matters. What people see is what they believe. The window's cold on my forehead and palms. Just two of the places the Almighty left his mark. The vote doesn't start for another hour. Four more until it's over and I'll give my speech. The entire strip has already been shut down. The streets packed with parked cars, crawling with people as far as I can see. Phones and faces pointed this way. Directly below, there's a small circle of red in front of the glass elevator, a staging and filming area for our special guests. Armed guards behind gates hold back my most devout followers, those filling the sidewalks, trampling the shrubbery, and spilling into the lake hoping to be mass-baptized. On the other side of the lake is a solid wall of vehicles, Metro and the National Guard working together to keep away everyone without a $10,000 red wristband. There's no question I can hear the crowd, their voice pulsing through my palm. That roar is all for me. People shake in their banners, a couple of them the size of rooftops, barely big enough to read. Charles, 316. Do it. Save us. Burn in hell. I turned from the window and limped to the pulpit I never asked for, but Father insisted on. 
He spent over a year working on it, 12 years waiting, waiting for me to finally speak, to tell the world who I am and what I've done, that I'm here to judge the living and the dead. Chapter 2 I was born mostly dead, my body purple, not a single breath or thump of my heart to be heard. Everyone figured I was already walking into heaven, spying the pearly gates with closed eyes, yet to see the mortal world. I guess that's where all this Messiah stuff started. Mother was the only one who believed I wasn't fully gone. She begged the committee not to put me in the ground, but they'd made their decision. Mother nearly tore off their skin, trying to keep them from putting me in that tiny casket. Once they had restrained her, they started hammering nails. Father fell to his knees, looked into the darkening sky, and begged God to spare me. My parents had been trying to have a child for almost seven years. The committee had told Mother she'd never conceive. I was a gift from heaven, and God decided to take that gift back. So Father offered a deal. He promised God I'd be a vessel for his will. I'd be his servant. And that's when my cry ripped through the night. Mother tore off the top of the casket and pulled me from the earth just as the sun sank. At least that's the way Father recounts it. Just like all his other stories, it's a mix of fact and fancy, and no one will ever know how much of each. They're simply tales to build my legend. He says belief is the only thing that matters, that we must do everything to preserve it, because without faith there's no reason to live. My parents had moved to the commune in the early 90s. Father couldn't hold a job and was tired of the city. Laura, mother's sister, was convinced the radio waves were hurting mother's chance to conceive. Laura was already living on the little plantation in South Carolina just west of Charleston. They packed up their station wagon and drove east, cutting themselves off from society, deciding to reconnect with the earth. And Laura and the Friends of Solstice community greeted my parents at the gates with candles and song. Father says it wasn't a cult, more like a bunch of hippies trying to prove the ideals of the 60s weren't dead. He didn't talk about it much and never mentioned the wine, weed, or magic mushrooms. In his story, he always pointed out the rules, how the Friends of Solstice only had a few of them. No jealousy, no God, no politics, no violence. Mother had broken the fourth by injuring a committee member, even though he was the one who technically tried to bury me alive. The law was rule breakers were either sentenced to the forest for a period or banished for good. Since mother had to wean me, they allowed us to stay. Father kept talking about God, though. He began having dreams, visions in his mind's eye of a new plan for all of us. He said he'd been given a message by the archangel Gabriel. God has chosen Joshua to bring forth his new kingdom on earth. Father told everyone I would lead the people. The committee asked him to stop. Talking about God was forbidden. They said it brought too much division, too much suffering. By the time I was two, Father was fed up with the hippie garbage. He knew there was an almighty being, and my heartbeat was his proof. Father could no longer be silenced. He needed to spread the word. He even convinced a dozen others from the commune to follow us. I'm guessing they were high on dope, so it probably didn't take much effort. They packed up in the night and left Mother's sister behind, the clean break father insisted we needed. After a few days, they found a dilapidated house in Hartsville. The property was on five acres. It belonged to this little old lady, Mrs. Hester, who let us live there for next to nothing. Father said we were pilgrims on a journey to God. Mrs. Hester was lonely and dying of cancer. She passed a few weeks later, left the place to father in her will, an open and shut case of divine intervention. With Mrs. Hester's passing, the help of his followers, and a small loan, father built our church, converting the attached garage into our sacristy. Our raised stage was a bunch of two-by-fours and plywood covered by a deep red carpet. More plywood painted white became the back of the stage with mother's scarlet satin curtain hanging down the middle. Mother said it was to hide the opening, but it also made it more mysterious. 
There weren't any lights or windows inside that sliver of space we called the passage where all the junk we couldn't throw out filled the right side. To the left was the door that led into our laundry room. The altar, pulpit, and kneeler on stage, along with the piano right before it, took up almost all of the garage. Father tore out the massive garage door and expanded the walls lengthwise, made it flush with the front of our house. Stage right, the church shared our kitchen's blood-red stained glass window and a plain one in the living room we always kept curtained. Stage left were two sets of windows on the swamp side for natural light. To keep the cost down, Father covered the dirt driveway with green artificial grass painted pious white, a thick line of red down the middle. We had three rows of three folding chairs on either side of the line, with room for at least twice as many rows. Each of the chairs came with a cushion, but I didn't get one because Father said kneeling was good for me and would make me stronger. An overhead fan was the last thing added, but all it did was push around the hot summer air. My muddled memory is full of gaping holes, but occasionally there are sharp points like knives that stick out clearly. Earliest I can remember is when I was five, middle of summer. It was the Lord's Day, which meant it was my day. I was carrying my cross in my spot next to the altar. Father wanted me to carry a real wooden cross, but Mother said it was too heavy. She made one by wrapping brown canvas around cardboard tubes. The canvas was that same scratchy stuff she used for the pulpit's yellow banner, which read, The Second Sun, above a large red flame. I paced in my spot with my shiny black shoes, two sizes too small. I was growing too fast. Father said he wasn't blowing an entire Lord's Day collection on clothing every month. The canvas was rubbing my neck raw. Finally, it was time to kneel. The solid oak piece was Father's very first creation, the wood so smooth yet so hard, fit for the Son of God. The pain in my neck and feet moved to my knees. I folded my fingers and squeezed. I could feel the congregation staring at me. I couldn't show any discomfort. That's what Father instructed. The flock needed to see strength, God's strength. Our congregation had dwindled to a little over half a dozen people. Most of the friends of Solstice had gone back to the plantation. Our remaining followers were people from the neighborhood and a couple of homeless vagabonds who lived in our basement. Old man Thomas lived up the road. He liked to walk into town on Sundays and would stop by to get out of the sun. Usually he'd stumble about, talk a little too loud. This day was no different, and his breath stung my eyes from five feet away. The tips of my shoes pressed to the floor, my knees pinched together. I drove my shoulders back, my chest pushed out with elbows resting on the kneeler's ledge. My fingers pointed to the heavens. I was the picture of peace. Father rose from his comfy chair, his black suit matching his wavy hair and watchful eyes. I stuck a peek and saw Mother in the front row smiling at both of us, her neck muscles standing out like strings on some strange instrument. Father was a giant behind his pulpit, which was two small desks stacked on top of each other, hidden behind Mother's fiery banner. There was no microphone. Father wouldn't have needed it even if we had been there a thousand people deep. You could probably hear him in Florida when he felt the spirit. Jesus, against his father's wishes, drew his sword as he led his battalion of angels into the depths of hell, charging to take down the demons of darkness. Father was reading from the very first book of the Lost Gospels, the only one he'd written so far. He was simply the instrument transcribing the message, one that he claimed finally infused the New Testament with the righteous passion of the old. Sweat dripped over my brow and into my eye, but I didn't blink. I tapped my shoe on the plywood, my toenail pushing back into swollen skin, my foot throbbing like a big fat bullfrog. I kept breathing through my nose, stared straight ahead, tried not to listen to what Father was saying. He was talking about how there were demons everywhere trying to tempt and distract Jesus, just like my sweat, which was begging to be swiped. The father said despite their best efforts, the good angels were overwhelmed by the demons, their wings burnt to a crisp, bodies flung into the lake of fire below. Jesus stood all alone in the darkness. But he couldn't turn back. Jesus continued down the cliff's winding path. With each wet step, Jesus tried not to think of what he walked on, his feet sinking in the rotten corpses, sliding in their gore. 
My hands ached as Father retold the story of the demon pinning Jesus to the rocks, his barbed tail shooting through Jesus' left hand, a black talon piercing the right, the blood of Christ bubbling on the bodies below. Father said it would be the fate of anyone who didn't follow me. I was the only true path. I pretended to listen as Father finished up his reading. I pretended to pray. We ask this in Joshua's name, Father said. This was my cue to rise and throw off my cross. It landed with the lightest thud. The congregation smiled. They thought I was adorable. This only angered Father. Those who can't repent shall all burn in hell. Whether they are family or friends, anyone who does not accept the path will be damned for eternity. Father dabbed his hanky over his brow. Sweat ran like a river down my butt crack. All we can do is speak the truth and spread the word. That is our mission. Save as many as we can before it's time to be judged. Let them know that Jesus Christ has returned. He stretched his arms wide and turned to me. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ has come again. Mother and most of the others said, Amen. I picked up my cross and stared straight ahead. I hated having to keep my chin up so high while everyone stared at me, knowing I was just a boy who'd done nothing special. The father promised a new chapter the following Sunday and started us down the aisle. Didn't even wait for Mother to get on the piano. Our tiny flock sang as we shuffled across the grass, out the door, up our porch, and into the house. I went straight to the kitchen to get the basket of oatmeal raisin cookies Mother made every week, the one good thing to look forward to. Usually, Father would head back out and talk with the people after a service, but when I turned to take the basket outside, he filled the doorway. Without a word, he whacked the basket out of my hands, cookies bouncing off my face, the basket landing on the linoleum. The front door closed, and Mother ran inside, stopping at the doorway, just in time to see Father flip over the kitchen table, our Sunday best bowls and plates shattering. Charles, please. Eight people, eight goddamned people! The weather's been nice. I'm sure some... Just shut your mouth! If I wanted your opinion, I'd damn well ask for it. Mother stood there with lowered eyes, then went to picking up the shards of glass. I knew better than to get in Father's way, so I stayed planted against the wall. I was hoping I'd slip right through the sheetrock when he turned his gaze to me. And what the hell was all that twitching and fidgeting? I stared at my shoes, at Mother's fingers collecting the sharp pieces. How in the world are people supposed to believe in anyone who can't even control his own fingers? I'd been scratching a little. The canvas cross was so itchy. I mean, what are we trying to do here? What are we trying to accomplish? I honestly didn't know. God's given us a roof over our heads, a place to worship and spread his good word, but it doesn't mean squat if no one hears it. Father took a deep breath and let it out, shook his head as he looked at me. Now you willing to play your part? Blood dripped from Mother's finger. Look at me when I speak to you. Yes? Yes what? Yes, sir. Father gripped a fistful of my hair, tilted my head back, his cold black eyes burrowing through me. My patience is wearing thin. I couldn't nod because he had a hold of my head. I just swallowed. It's time you prove your worth. Next time we're going into town— and you're going to inspire people to join our church. Why are we here? I asked. Because these people need to hear the truth, Father said. I couldn't read, but he made sure I knew what was on all the picket signs. His read, Repent or Burn. We were set up across the street from the Hartsville Baptist Church. Mother sat at a little folding table, straightening a stack of pamphlets. Each one had a picture of me as a baby with a little halo over my head. Old man Thomas was sleeping under the shade of a huge oak tree. He'd ridden with us into town so he could buy groceries. There were bags of liquor and deli meats beside him. Father kicked his leg. Get up! They're coming out! Old man Thomas groaned and staggered to his feet. I thought he was going to fall on me but he burped and stood tall with his picket sign. Fags go to hell. Father had stayed up all night making the signs. 
There were 15 other ones in the station wagon in case anyone passing by might want to join the cause. I hoisted the cardboard cross over my shoulder. The father had insisted I wear a crown of thorns. Mother had secretly snipped off the pointy tips to protect my head. The sun was so bright I could hardly see, but I, I could make out a truck rolling up. The teenagers inside were laughing. One of them threw a soda can at us. It clanged off the sidewalk and landed on the grass. "'They'll all pay,' Father said, his eyes locked on the church. The doors opened and the congregation poured out. The women were wearing lacy gloves and big hats. The men had on suits and ties. Everyone was fanning themselves or tugging on their shirts from the heat, but they were smiling. They were happy. Nothing like the flock walking out after our services, especially after one of Father's more fiery sermons, the kind where he spoke of what the demons did to our souls, the sermons that kept me awake most nights. Two little black boys ripped off their ties and started chasing each other. Their mother grabbed them by their collars, pulled them in tight. We ain't have five seconds and you two acting like fools. Turn away from your false gods and feast your eyes upon your savior. Father pointed at me, which was my cue to shuffle down the sidewalk with my cross. I moaned, keeping my face down until I had to turn back. The people in their nice clothes were staring at us like we were lunatics. Your days are numbered unless you embrace the second coming. My foot hit a crack and I started to stumble, but I kept myself moving. I knew Father saw my mistake. I kept pacing, moaning, trying to make up for what I'd done. We'd never actually performed something like this before. The father had handed out pamphlets on the street, and we'd given talks outside the homeless shelter, but we'd never staged a spectacle in front of a church. Mother just smiled and kept organizing her table. She was looking at the people, but she wasn't making eye contact, almost like she was staring right through them. Repent or burn, father yelled. Some of the congregation laughed. Others shook their heads and went back to chatting with each other. Old man Thomas said, Charles, I don't think niggas burn. He was trying to whisper, but he was too drunk for that. Father's eyes widened. The congregation had heard what he'd said. Dang it, Tom. What? I'm just saying that pigment don't feel the sun as much. Father tried to go back to his speech. Turn towards the light. The young man stepped off the curb, his face all furious. What did you say? He headed right for us. Other men followed. Say it again. I, I, Thomas stammered. I, I didn't. Mother hadn't told Father we should bring old man Thomas along, but Father wanted bodies for our demonstration. No one else would come. We are simply offering a better path, a path of redemption, Father said. Gentlemen, please. Brother Thomas didn't. Fuck your please. The man stepped right up to old man Thomas, who was shaking and looking all around, probably for a place to run. Call me that again, you racist piece of shit. I wasn't calling. I, I'm just, I'm just drunk. That just exposes the real you. The guy bent down and pulled out a bottle of whiskey from one of the grocery bags. He took his time unscrewing the cap. Come on, let's see some more. Please, I... I didn't mean nothing. Oh, I think you did. And I want to hear you say it. The young man raised the bottle over Thomas's shiny head. Bernard, stop that. An older woman in a purple dress forced her way through the men. Now let's just go. Whatever he said ain't worth it. The woman reached for the bottle, but Bernard pulled it away. Whiskey sloshed out and splattered old man Thomas, as well the woman. She squealed. Bernard! Mama, I'm... Look what you did to my dress! "'Give me back my booze,' Thomas said. He lunged and stumbled into Bernard, who shoved Thomas back. Then everyone was pushing. Father, too. There were legs and fists and men the size of refrigerators, everyone bouncing around. I got hit in the back as I squeezed between some bellies. There was nothing but darkness in that pile, so I wedged myself through to the light. I tripped off the curb. I was about to fall, but I flung my right foot forward and kept my balance, both legs stretched out like I was about to do the splits. I heard the screeching, tires skidding across the pavement. I think there was a horn. 
Mother and people were screaming. Then everything fell silent. You couldn't hear a sneeze. All I saw was the truck, the reflection of my face on the grill, my lips all wide, just like my eyes. Then the thunderous crack like I'd jumped off a skyscraper and landed on my back. Clouds were above me, the hot pavement searing my arms and neck, blood shot through my body in big pulsing throbs, my eyes were closed, but I could tell people were standing over me, blocking out the glare of the sun. There was screaming and some guy moaning, I didn't see him. Fingers touched my neck, something heavy on my chest. What's going on? Mother said, her voice taut as a guitar string about to break. Is he breathing? Tell us, Father said. I'm so sorry, mister, another guy had said. I swear, he, he came out of nowhere. A voice by my chest said, I don't hear anything. Oh, God, Mother wailed like I'd picture her doing in Father's story of my birth. I was kind of glad my eyes were closed so I couldn't see her in case she attacked with her nails. Look what you did! It felt like my ribs were squishing into my lungs. My fingers scraped along the pavement. I couldn't move my left arm. His body was pinning it down, but with my right hand, I finally pushed his head. Get off. The head lifted, and I opened my eyes and saw it was someone's gray-haired grandpa. Everyone was standing over me. I scooted back and got to my feet. They all said to sit down, but I didn't want to. I'm okay, I said. Mother knelt in front of me, stared with this horrified look as if my face had been ripped off. There was a car. I walked over, saw my reflection in the window. I still had eyes and a nose, but now there was one hell of a dent across my forehead. My hair was matted with sweat. There was a little blood on my cheek. I looked down. My clothes were a bit ripped, but I, but I didn't see anything too gruesome. Father grabbed me and stood me beside him on the sidewalk. There was something strange in his eyes. He was happy. He raised my hand and spun me back to the crowd. He clearly didn't know what to make of me. "'Joshua lives!' father yelled. "'Your savior has returned!' Two of the women made the sign of the cross. The others circled around, everyone staring at me with this confused reverence. "'Say something to them,' father whispered. I didn't know what he wanted, but they were clearly waiting to hear my voice. "'It's... All okay, I said. I just meant my head and body, but they seemed to think I meant something more. I'm not going to lie and say the next week our church was packed, but there were more people and less than a quarter of them homeless. The first row was taken by Mr. and Mrs. Walker and their four little girls, each of them in a peach dress, their long curly hair pushed back over their shoulders. Mr. Walker owned the gas station at the edge of town. He also happened to be the one who'd hit me with his truck. When the collection plate went around, he, he dropped in a nice stack of bills. Mr. and Mrs. Durrington, the wrinkled old couple that lived at the top of our hill, were seated behind the Walkers. They'd never actually attended one of our services, but word had spread, and they wanted to make sure we weren't practicing voodoo. Mrs. Durrington wasn't a strong whisperer. She said, Those voodoo folks sacrifice goats and all, and I don't want no goat blood in this neighborhood. Doc Hargrove and his black leather bag took up two seats in the third row. Doc had checked me out after the accident. Didn't find a single fracture, just a dent in my skull and the bruise on my back. And when he asked witnesses what they'd seen, he almost called it a miracle. Almost. Old father would have loved that, but Doc would only go so far as to say it was remarkable. There were a couple of other people I didn't know sitting in the last two rows, father had added. Everyone was looking at me as I paced around with my cardboard cross. Everyone except mother. She sat up straight in her lily-white dress, focused only on father. She didn't even glance in my direction. Ever since Mr. Walker slammed me with his truck, she hardly said a word. At first I thought my near-death moment had frightened her, but I would started to realize she wasn't worried for me. She was freaked out. If I so much as tanked a juice glass with a fork, she'd leap out of her seat. It was as if I'd done something wrong by not dying in the street. 
Father had been keeping us busy mowing the lawn, painting the church, printing up new pamphlets, making goodies to sell after the service. He knew people were going to be curious and there'd be more butts in the seats. He wanted to make sure their first impression was a good one. Father spent every night that week working on his sermons. He must have downed ten gallons of coffee. He'd pace and talk into this little handheld recorder and make Mother type it up each morning. He chucked most of it into the trash, but every so often he'd get this look like he'd found gold in a river. He'd mark those lines and have Mother type it up all over again. We even had a little band, with Mother on piano, Father on guitar, and Old Man Thomas on harmonica. He was almost sober enough to make it through the whole service without nodding off. Initially, Father had wanted me to sing, but after a brief audition, he let me know I was more of a listener. During the song, I stood next to my parents and stayed away from old man Thomas's foul breath as I hummed along. Father said it made me more of a mystery. He was actually being nice to me for the first time. Even when I screwed up, he didn't hit me. In order for the people to believe I'd survived the accident unscathed, he couldn't leave any new marks. In some ways, getting hit by that truck was the best thing for my well-being. After that first service, people were shaking my hand and saying things like, I still can't believe it. And you sure are resilient, got to give you that. But they kept angling their heads, trying to really look me over, hoping to find a scratch or a nick. One guy even picked me up in a tight bear hug. Pretty sure he was trying to see if I had any broken ribs. Mother stayed near the house in polite conversation with a few people. It was obvious she just wanted to go inside and escape all this. I felt like a freak show with everyone prodding and poking. I didn't blame her for not wanting to watch. Father, on the other hand, well, he was in heaven. He spoke of the visions and dreams he'd had since the day I was born. He said, when God delivered this child to earth, he was as dead as a severed snake. But I fell to my knees and promised we'd be his vessels. And just like that, Joshua's cries rang out. God had answered our prayers. And he sent us this message. Nothing, not even a truck can injure his son. Nothing compares to the power of the Lord. Father was certain this was only the beginning. He was convinced the people would just keep pouring in. He even talked about having to build a real church to accommodate all the new members. But the next week, we only had a couple more. The week after that saw a couple of less. After a few months, we were down to just over a dozen. Father's anger returned. His face was always red, but he still couldn't bring a hand to mother or me. He'd get close and raise a fist high, but at the last second he'd pull up and punch the wall or just fall to his knees, all that hate cursing through his veins. Why have you teased us, Lord, bringing us just a taste of your glory, only to rip it away? Sometimes he'd, he'd take the blame, but most times he'd put it square on my back. One Sunday night, after a long day stewing over an almost empty church, Father grabbed my hand and yanked me along. You haven't given the people the purity they deserve, he said. You haven't repented and begged God to cleanse your soul. Father opened the basement door and told the few homeless men to take my room. He shoved me down the stairs into the darkness. From the top of the stairs, he yelled, I don't hear no prayer. So I prayed. I said the Lord's Prayer and a Hail Mary and some of the ones Father had written himself. Blessed God, I ask you to take your sword and slice off the infectious sins clinging to my mind and heart. Chop off the wickedness and rotten core of my body. Give me peace and purity. Make me perfection so that I can deliver your spirit. Father carried down the hard wooden kneeler. He expected me to use it, but when he went upstairs, I'd sit on my butt and act like I was suffering. It's strange how your eyes adjust to the dark. That first night, I could hardly make out the stairs or walls. By the second night, I saw spiders spinning webs and a whole line of ants devouring something the homeless guys had dropped. I couldn't make out the demons, but I knew they were there. I heard things down in the basement, too. All the creaking whenever someone walked into a room. Mother's whispers late at night. She begged Father to let me upstairs and end this, but he refused. 
He said starvation purifies the mind. The smell of cookies, bread, and pies made mine crystal clear. By the fourth day, Mother was sneaking me sandwiches. Now don't leave no crumbs, she said. Your father sees this, and it's both our behinds. I devoured those sandwiches. I didn't even worry about the crumbs, figuring the ants deserved a meal, too. That night I slept like a baby until just before the sun popped up. My whole stomach was gurgling and clenching. I had to go to the bathroom, something awful. Father had given me a bucket, but since I was only getting a cup of water, it was just for piss. I didn't even have anything to wipe with. For a second I considered sneaking up and making a beeline for the bathroom, but I heard Father's big clomping footsteps. I didn't have a choice. I hovered over that bucket and tried to push as fast as I could, but my legs kept shaking and I fell in it mid-shit. I honestly didn't care if Father found out about Mother's sandwiches. I just wanted out that damn basement. My fists were wet with that filth as I marched up those steps. I was full ready for Father's verbal lashing. But it wasn't even there. He'd gone into town. Mother found me in the kitchen. Oh, Joshua, she started to touch me, but pulled back. Come on, let's get you in the shower. We'll burn these clothes. It took a good half hour to scrub off the stink. Mother made me chicken noodle soup. Father came home and found me on the couch. What are you doing? Did I tell you to come up? No. No what? No, sir. Charles, I let him up. You what? He got sick. You left him down there with a bucket? I'd never heard Mother stand up to Father, and by the look on his face, it was clear this was uncharted territory. But when he saw my soiled jeans in a bag, even he couldn't defend his actions. Well, I was going to bring you up anyway, he said. It's time we got you a real cross. That afternoon, we took a long walk out back, and Father hacked down a tree. Together, we dragged the big log back to the house. He sanded it down a bit and nailed a second beam to it. We'll stain it later, he said. This'll do for the next service. That Sunday, I paced in my usual spot as that heavy thing nearly sent me to my knees with every step. I stumbled once, and Mother almost went for me, but Father waved her off. He was in an especially fire mood. Hardly anyone had shown up, not even Mr. Walker, who was without question the most consistent member on account of he nearly killed me. After the final prayer, we didn't even stick around to mingle with our members. We just got in the car and drove straight to the gas station where Mr. Walker was sitting behind his bulletproof glass. Father reached into that little slot where you pass the money and get your cigarettes or candy or what have you. Mr. Walker only had to step back a foot to escape, and I stayed in the car with the window down. "'You think you can just not show up to service?' Father asked. Well, "'The guy who works Sundays called in sick.' I don't care if you ruptured your spleen, you show up to our church. That was the deal. Charles, that might have. You hit my son with your truck. And I have apologized, and I tried to repay you. Well, you're not even close. That's not fair. Your boy wasn't even hurt. Not hurt? You know, actually, he was banged up. You just didn't say anything. Been having all sorts of neck problems. Now, Charles, and I'd hate to have to get a lawyer and take this little station away from you. I mean, it's a child we're talking about. There's no need for that. Plenty of witnesses. They'd be happy to vouch. No, come on. I promise I'll be there next week. You're going to do more than that, Gary. You're going to make sure our little church is filled to the brim. I can't bring my kids. You'll bring whoever I tell you to. My wife put her foot down. You scare people, Charles. Scare people? I share nothing but the Lord's message. Well, it frightens my children, and they've had nightmares. I'm done talking. If that place is in full come Sunday, you'll be speaking to my lawyer. Mr. Walker looked around a little, then nodded. The father got back in the car. On the drive home, he grumbled. Frightening people. What do you think hell's going to be? I'm saving people's souls, he turned to me. You hear what I'm saying? I nodded. I'll use whatever tool I can to make sure God's message is heard. Well? Well, what? It's just you. Say, God is all loving. So? He's also not to be disobeyed. Right. But maybe you could talk more about the love part just to remind everyone. Oh, so now you're telling me how to preach. No, sir. 
It's just, well, even sometimes I forget there's a good side too. Yeah, well, that's because you're an idiot. But despite what Father might have thought at the time, his next sermon was different. Oh, he still hammered on about all of God's wrath, but his face softened when he spoke about eternal paradise. He said your best day on earth wouldn't be one-tenth as wonderful as your worst moment in heaven. Then he told a story I'd never heard about a dolphin protecting her babies by throwing herself in front of a fisherman's spear. Father said that God holds nothing in higher esteem than self-sacrifice. That dolphin was the first animal allowed through the pearly gates and that all kinds of animals, especially pets we've lost, would be waiting for us in heaven. Some of the adults in attendance snickered a bit, but every child in that church was grinning from ear to ear. And there were a lot of children, too. Mr. Walker had somehow convinced his daughter's Girl Scout troop to show up, their parents as well. By the end of the service, after Mother sang Amazing Grace, there wasn't a dry eye in the place. And most everyone made a point to tell Father and me they'd be back next week. Half weren't lying, either. The next service wasn't as packed, but there weren't as many empty seats, either. Father even stuck to the 50-50 split of damnation and God's love, and the following week we were back to standing room only. The collections plates were full, too. We weren't rich by any means, but Father said we had breathing room. The wick had been lit. Our flame would begin to shine bright.